to make a decision. This is what you're learning in the book, uh, Persuasion, Information, results in conviction, conviction results in desire, desire results in action. And here's something very wonderful. Notice how this is an interaction between you and the Spirit, because you provide the information, the Spirit brings about conviction, the Spirit brings about a desire to cooperate with what has been preached, and the hearer responds with the action. So when you see, when we talk about preaching being a supernatural interaction, a supernatural transaction, it really is, between you, God, and the listener. Okay, and this is basically what you're learning there in the um, in the book Persuasion. Exactly correct. <coughs> okay, um, the appeal, the most important part. The appeal should be appealing. Have I told you the story about Nathan, who invited the person to stand up? No. Never. No, come on. Okay, very quickly. So Nathan is preaching in a, a sermon in Minot, North Dakota, and he's been asked to preach by the pastor. He's not the pastor. He's the Bible worker. He's been asked to preach. And uh, he, he's preaching this sermon, and while you're listening to the sermon, he's young, I mean, he's two years into the faith, maybe. While you're listening to the sermon, you can almost tell as he's starting to make the appeal, you're like, no, no, he's not going to do it. Because the little church that he's preaching probably has 60 people in it, and he's, seeing, he's saying things like, you know, maybe, you've, maybe you have been involved in an adulterous affair. Maybe you have been unfaithful to your spouse. Or maybe you, and maybe it wasn't just with another person. Maybe in your mind you have been, or, or maybe you've been looking at pornographic uh, magazines or websites and, and you have been unfaithful. And the Spirit of God is speaking to you right now and you want to say, I have been, and you're just like, no! You're going to see it's coming, you know. You can't even, it's not a video, it's a tape. I still have the tape. It's called The Almost Christian. I still have the tape. And at, you, can just, you can just feel the tension in the room, even though it happened, you know, 12 years ago and you're not even there. And he's like, if that describes you, brothers and sisters, I want you to stand to your feet if that applies to you. <laughs> you're just like, <laughs> okay then, all right. So any adulterers want to stand to your feet right now? We'll put the spotlight on you. So uh, not surprisingly, no one responds to the appeal. And so there's this moment of sort of awkward silence, and then Nathan's like, well, you can still stand in your hearts, you know. <laughs> so make the appeal appealing, i.e., that's the word, appealing, okay? Try to emphasize that it's not so much a turning from sin, but it's a turning to God. Does that make sense? And, and I've had my share of funny appeals too, but I just remember that one really well, so I'm picking on Nathan a little bit. So your appeal should be appealing. Your appeal should flow logically from the message, if you've preached on, on, you know, the health message, then you may not make an invitation for baptism. Maybe, you know. Unlike our friends in the Baptist church, they'll preach on anything and everything, and then they'll say, who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? Come forward right now and receive him. You know, it's like you preach on anything, but that's the appeal that you make. Make sure that the appeal flows logically from what it is that you've preached, okay? The appeal must be clearly communicated, of course. Whatever the actual response is, make sure that it's clear, especially if you're doing like a decision card um, or if you're using a sort of multi-tiered appeal for the first people just to stand, the second people to come forward, and those that want to be rebaptized or whatever to come forward, uh, make sure that it's clear. Uh, the appeal can be benefited by a powerful story or a testimony. Of course, that goes without saying. How to respond to the appeal must be clearly communicated. We've just mentioned that. Who the appeal is for must be clearly communicated. Specific appeals are better than general appeals. If you don't make an appeal, your sermon is incomplete, and you need to be prepared to follow up the decisions that are made, whatever those decisions are. Ellen White writes in Gospel Workers, page 92, in every discourse, how many discourses? Seven. In every discourse, fervent appeal should be made to the people to forsake their sins and to turn to Christ. The popular sins and indulgences of our day should be condemned, and practical godliness, there it is again, should be enforced. The minister should be deeply in earnest himself, feeling from the heart the words he utters, and unable to repress his feeling of concern for the souls of men and women for whom Christ died. Of the master it was said, the zeal of thine house hath eaten thee up, John 2, 17. The same earnestness should be felt by his representatives. Amen? Amen. Deeply in earnest. There's another place where Ellen White actually says, we cannot be too much in earnest. She says that. We cannot be too much in earnest. Okay? And just uh, last few moments here. The master's confirmation, uh, no Holy Spirit equals no power, okay? No Holy Spirit equals no power. Acts of the Apostles, page 50, the presence of the Spirit with God's workers will give the proclamation of the truth a power 
that not all the honor or glory of the world could give. Okay? So you need to have the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that takes the words, that takes the message, that takes the appeal, that takes the lessons, that takes the points, that takes the illustrations, that takes the anecdotes, that takes the testimony, and applies it to the individual person. You'll sometimes hear me when I pray at the beginning of a sermon, Father, please take this one-size-fits-all message and tailor-make it to apply to every single person in here. That's what I'm praying for. Because I can only preach one sermon, but I need the Spirit to make it apply to Patricia, to apply to Max, to apply to Allie, to apply to Dee, to apply to Mitch. The Spirit of God can do what I cannot do. Make the application. I'll do my best to give some examples of application, but I can't hit on every possible application out of this sermon. So the Spirit makes the application. So we have to have the Spirit. Evangelism, page 169. There is a living power in truth. The Holy Spirit is the agent that opens human minds to the truth. The Holy Spirit does that. But the ministers and workers who proclaim the truth must show certainty and decision. I love that. They are to go forth in faith and present the word as though they believed it. Try to make those for whom you labor understand that it is God's truth. Preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This will confront Satan's lies. So it's the cooperation between the Spirit and the preacher. Prompt, energetic, and earnest action may save an undecided soul. No one can tell how much is lost by attempting to preach, here it is, without the unction of the Holy Spirit. There are souls in every congregation who are hesitating, almost persuaded to be holy for God. The decision is being made for time and for eternity, but it is too often the case that the minister has not the what? The Spirit. The minister doesn't have the Spirit and power of the message of truth in his own heart. And hence, what happens when we don't have the Spirit? No direct appeals are made to those that are trembling in the balance. The result is that impressions are not deepened upon the hearts of the convinced ones, and they leave, the, look at this, they leave the meeting feeling less inclined to accept the service of Christ than when they came. In other words, they're worse off after the sermon. Less inclined. They decide to wait for a more favorable opportunity, but it never comes. That godless discourse, she calls it. If we don't have the Spirit, it's a godless discourse. Like Cain's offering lacked the Savior. The golden opportunity is lost and the cases of these souls are decided. Is it too, is not too much at stake to preach in an indifferent manner and without feeling the burden of souls? Mm. Powerful stuff there. Ask and you will receive the Holy Spirit. This is the promise of Scripture in Luke eleven thirteen 13 and Matthew 7, 7. Real time and real prayer is essential. Live a consistent life. As we've already mentioned, be a Christian first and then a preacher. Deliver a biblically sound message, a message that the Holy Spirit can cooperate. Don't ask the Holy Spirit to cooperate with an unbiblical message, which he can't do. The inspirer of the, of the scriptures cannot cooperate with an, a message that is out of harmony with what he inspired. So make sure it's biblical. Remember yourself and teach others that the Holy Spirit is not a feeling or some kind of excitement. Believe the Holy Spirit will attend every earnest, biblical, practical sermon presentation that he is invited to to attend. Great Controversy, page 525, one of my all-time favorite statements from the pen of Ellen White, it is part of God's plan to grant us an answer to the prayer of faith, that which he would not bestow did we not thus ask. Okay? You ask, you pray, you petition, and God will answer in ways that he otherwise could not. What did Jesus say? Ask and ye shall receive. So it is part of God's plan to grant us an answer to the prayer of faith, that which he would not bestow did we not thus ask. Okay? Remember that. So we've been over that. And finally, and least importantly, so look at what we've gone over here. The messenger's commitment, how would we summarize that? Be a Christian first and then a preacher. Can you say amen to that? Amen. The meaning's correctness, how would we summarize that? Very simply, preaching is what is true through you. The message is content. It's a, it's a slice of bread, a slice of bread. Take that one point. You can substantiate it. You can corroborate it with other points, but be sure that everything leads to a single purpose statement, okay? The master's confirmation, we need the Holy Spirit, amen? amen? And back to the message's content very quickly. Remember, does anyone remember the four things that we're to be true to? Does anyone remember those? The first, be true to God, true to the text, true to yourself, true to life. Very good. Be true to God, be true to the text, be true to life, and be true to yourself. Okay, that's preaching in a nutshell. And then finally, and least importantly, I want to say it again, is the method's charisma. Charisma is good, content is better. Okay? 
When some, it's, and it's sad how often even people who are spiritually mature fall into this immature perspective on preaching that preaching is delivery. Preaching is not the, the competency of delivery. It's not, it's not the competency of the oration. Obama is a great speaker just for or, uh, uh, oratory's sake. You know, you can have somebody who's a very good speaker, but that is not preaching. Preaching is content-driven, not charisma-driven. So a good sermon to me is not somebody who never stumbled over his words and was absolutely confident and poised, etc., and used all of the right illustrations and all of the right anecdotes. To me, a good sermon is, did I learn something educationally in terms of Scripture? Was there an educational component? Was I taught? Making sense? That's a good sermon. So charisma is fine. Hey, listen, I have no problem with you dressing it up. You, you be as in earnest and as passionate and as spirit-filled as you can be, but be sure that the, the sermon is content-driven. If I had to choose between content of an A and charisma of a C or content of a C and charisma an A, what am I going to choose? I'll take A content and C charisma all day. All day. Because charisma, I don't need charisma. I just need somebody who has a, an experience with Jesus to tell me about what they've learned in Scripture. Not somebody to yell at me in a clever way. Making sense? Okay, great. True preaching is not entertainment. Amen? But sometimes it is entertaining. And there, it's important to recognize the distinction, and many spiritually immature people fail to grasp this distinction. For example, I just recently read this very interesting. This will be very quick, I hope. Um, I just recently read this very interesting article by Dallas Willard where he talks about the difference between amusement, entertainment, and the arts. Okay? And he sets them up, I've kind of got them in reverse here, but he sets them up in kind of a tier in terms of least important, more important, most important. I follow this very interesting. I thought his case was very interesting. If you say that someone is amusing, that's usually a negative thing. Isn't that true? I mean, you can just, if I said something like, if somebody said to me, oh, you know, what do you think of, what do you think of Jan? If you said, oh, what do you think of Jan? You know, he seems like a really nice guy. If I said to you, which I wouldn't say, by the way, Jan, but I just saw you, but the first one that came to me. If I said, oh, I find him amusing. What does that communicate? You live with him as well. Say again? <laughs> I'm laughing at him. It, it communicates an almost kind of a disdain, doesn't it? Or if an idea, oh, that's amusing. It's kind of almost like, not really worthy of my attention, but uh, whatever. It's amusing. So he basically says that amusement is the lowest common denominator for things that occupy our attention. Amusements are things that require no intellectual endeavor. They're, they're typically just passing the time. And he uses the illustration of a person being amusing as almost a negative thing. Not that amusement is all negative, but that amusement is, requires no intellectual commitment. It's the lowest on the, the pole. Entertainment, he says, is a step up from amusement in this sense. Entertainment can be negative, but it's not necessarily negative. For example, if you say such and such, a so-and-so called person is an entertainer, is that making a value judgment on them? No. Not really. In other words, there are people who that's their job. Their job is to be an entertainer. That's not necessarily a value judgment. Um, a, a musician could be an entertainer, somebody who entertains. Um, somebody that uh, puts on a, a certain kind of a show would be an entertainer. It, it's not making a value judgment to say that a person is enter an entertainer, and it's making even less of a value judgment to say that a person did something or sometimes said something that was entertaining. Okay, now let me try and explain that. 